Map of the Great White Fleet's Voyage The Great White Fleet was the popular nickname for the group of United States Navy battleships which completed a journey around the globe from December 16, 1907 to February 22, 1909 by order of President Theodore Roosevelt. Its mission was to make friendly courtesy visits to numerous countries while displaying new U.S. naval power to the world. One goal was to deter a threatened war with Japan since tensions were high in 1907. It familiarized the 14,500 officers and men with the logistical and planning needs for extended fleet action far from home. Hulls were painted a stark white, giving the Armada its nickname. It consisted of 16 battleships divided into two squadrons, along with various small escorts. Roosevelt sought to demonstrate growing American military power and Blue Water Navy capability. After long neglecting the Navy, Congress started generous appropriations in the late 1880s. Beginning with just 90 small ships, over one-third of them wooden and obsolete, the Navy quickly added new steel fighting vessels. The fleet's capital ships were already obsolete compared to the British dreadnoughts in 1907. Nevertheless, it was by far the largest and most powerful fleet that had ever circled the globe. The mission was a success at home and in every country it visited, as well as Europe flagship Connecticut. One of a set of commemorative postcards of the ships of the Great White Fleet in the twilight of his administration. United States President Theodore Roosevelt dispatched 16 U.S. Navy battleships of the Atlantic Fleet on a worldwide voyage of circumnavigation from December 16, 1907 to February 22, 1909. The hulls were painted white, the Navy's peacetime color scheme, and decorated with gilded scrollwork with a red, white, and blue banner on their bows. These ships would later come to be known as the Great White Fleet. The purpose of the fleet deployment was multifaceted. Ostensibly, it served as a showpiece of American goodwill, as the fleet visited numerous countries and harbors. In this, the voyage was not unprecedented. Naval courtesy calls, many times in conjunction with the birthdays of various monarchs and other foreign celebrations, had become common in the 19th century. Port calls showcased pomp, ceremony, and militarism during a period of rising pre-war nationalism. In 1891, a large French fleet visited Kronstadt, Russia, in conjunction with negotiations between the two nations. Although France and Russia had been hostile to each other for at least three decades prior, the significance of the call was not lost on Russia, and Tsar Nicholas II signed a treaty of alliance with France in 1894. As navies grew larger, naval pageants grew longer, more elaborate, and more frequent. The United States began participating in these events in 1902 when Roosevelt invited Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany to send a squadron for a courtesy call to New York City. Invitations for U.S. Navy ships to participate in fleet celebrations in the United Kingdom, France, and Germany followed. Additionally, the voyage of the Great White Fleet demonstrated both at home and on the world stage that the U.S. had become a major sea power in the years after its triumph in the Spanish-American War. With possessions that included Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. This was not the first demonstration of naval power however, during the Algeciras Conference in 1906, which was convened to settle a diplomatic crisis between France and Germany over the fate of Morocco. Roosevelt had ordered eight battleships to maintain a presence in the Mediterranean Sea. Since Japan had arisen as a major sea power with the 1905 annihilation of the Russian fleet at Tsushima, the deployment of the Great White Fleet was therefore intended, at least in part, to send a message to Tokyo that the American fleet could be deployed anywhere, even from its Atlantic ports, and would be able to defend American interests in the Philippines and the Pacific. The most serious tensions between the United States and Japan came in 1907, leading to widespread speculation among experts that war was imminent between the two. The main cause was intense Japanese resentment against the mistreatment of Japanese in California. Pulitzer Prize-winning biographer Henry Pringle states that sending Great White Fleet so dramatically to Japan in 1908 was, the direct result of the Japanese trouble. Tensions rapidly de-escalated after the fleet's very friendly reception in Yokohama. Thus the gesture neutralized the diplomatic trouble that had resulted from anti-Japanese riots in San Francisco. Those problems had been resolved by the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 and the fleet visit was a friendly gesture to Japan. The Japanese welcomed it. Roosevelt saw the deployment as one that would encourage patriotism, and give the impression that he would teach Japan a lesson in polite behavior, as historian Robert A. Hart phrased it. After the fleet had crossed the Pacific, 
Japanese statesmen realized that the balance of power in the East had changed since the Route Takahira Agreement that defined relevant spheres of interest of the United States and Japan. The voyage also provided an opportunity to improve the sea and battle worthiness of the fleet. While earlier capital ship classes such as the Kearsarge, Illinois and Maine were designed primarily for coastal defense, later classes such as the Virginia and Connecticut. Incorporated lessons learned from the Spanish-American War and were conceived as ships with the highest practicable speed and the greatest radius of action. In the words of the appropriation bills approved by the United States Congress for their construction. They were intended as modern warships capable of long-range operations. Nevertheless, the experience gained in the recent war with Spain had been limited. Roosevelt's stated intent was to give the Navy practice in navigation, communication, coal consumption and fleet maneuvering. Navy professionals maintained, however, that such matters could be served better in home waters. In light of what had happened to the Russian Baltic fleet, they were concerned about sending their own fleet on a long deployment, especially since part of the intent was to impress a modern, battle-tested Navy that had not known defeat. The fleet was untested in making such a voyage, and Tsushima had proven that extended deployments had no place in practical strategy. The Japanese Navy was close to coaling and repair facilities, while American ships could coal in the Philippines, docking facilities were far from optimal. An extended stop on the west coast of the United States during the voyage for overhaul and refurbishment in dry dock would be a necessity. Planning for the voyage, however, showed a dearth of adequate facilities there, as well. The main sea channel of the Mare Island Navy Yard near San Francisco was too shallow for battleships, which left only the Puget Sound Navy Yard in Bremerton, Washington, for refit and repair. The Hunters Point Civilian Yard in San Francisco could accommodate capital ships, but had been closed due to lack of use and was slated for demolition. President Roosevelt ordered that Hunters Point be reopened, facilities be brought up to date, and the fleet to report there. Also, the question of adequate resources for coaling existed. This was not an issue when the Atlantic fleet cruised the Atlantic or Caribbean, as fuel supplies were readily available. However, the United States did not enjoy a worldwide network of coaling stations like that of Great Britain, nor did it have an adequate supply of auxiliary vessels for resupply. During the Spanish-American War, this lack had forced Admiral George Dewey to buy a collier load of British coal in Hong Kong before the Battle of Manila Bay to ensure his squadron would not run out of steam at sea. The need had been even more pressing for the Russian Baltic fleet during its long deployment during the Russo-Japanese War, not just for the distance it was to steam. But also because, as a belligerent nation in wartime, most neutral ports were closed to it due to international law. While the lack of support vessels was pointed out and a vigorous program of building such ships suggested by Rear Admiral George W. Melville, who had served as chief of the Bureau of Equipment, his words were not heeded adequately until World War II. Federal regulations that restricted supply vessels for Navy ships to those flying the United States flag complicated by the lack of an adequate United States Merchant Marine, proved another obstacle. Roosevelt initially offered to award Navy supply contracts to American skippers whose bids exceeded those of foreign captains by less than 50%. Many carriers declined this offer because they could not obtain enough cargo to cover the cost of the return trip. Two months before the fleet sailed, Roosevelt ordered the Navy Department to contract 38 ships to supply the fleet with the 125,000 tons of coal it would need to steam from Hampton Roads, Virginia, to San Francisco. Only eight of these were American registered, most of the other 30 were of British registry. This development was potentially awkward, since part of the mission was to impress Japan with the perception of overwhelming American naval power. Britain had become a military ally of Japan in 1905 with the Anglo Japanese Alliance which obliged it to aid Japan should a foreign power declare war against it. Technically, the list of potential combatants included the United States. The British government decided to play both sides of the political fence with the intent of moderating any Japanese-American friction that might arise. Prior to the ship's departure, Congress raised concerns about funding. According to the Naval Historical Center, Maine Senator Eugene Hale made his intention known to withhold funding for the effort. The president's response was that if Congress was unwilling to fund the trip, he already had the funds to send the fleet out into the Pacific. But if Congress wanted the fleet to return home, they would have to fund the other half of the trip. As noted by Roosevelt biographer Edmund Morris, the president would not be deterred. He stated I am commander-in-chief, and my decision is absolute in the matter. Kansas sails ahead of Vermont as the fleet leaves Hampton Roads, Virginia, on December 16, 1907. 
a 1908 postcard welcoming the fleet to Australia the fleet passing through the Magellan Straits by naval artist Henry Riuterdal, who travelled with the fleet on USS Calgoa as the Panama Canal was not yet complete. The fleet had to pass through the Straits of Magellan. The scope of such an operation was unprecedented in US history, as ships had to sail from all points of the compass to rendezvous points and proceed according to a carefully orchestrated, well-conceived plan. It involved almost the entire operational capability of the U.S. Navy. Unlike the formidable obstacles that had faced the Russian fleet on its voyage from the Baltic to the Pacific, which eventually led to its destruction by the Japanese in 1905. The U.S. effort benefited from a peaceful environment which aided the coordination of ship movements. In port after port, citizens in the thousands turned out to see and greet the fleet. In 1908, the Great White Fleet visited Monterey, California, from 1 to 4 May. The nearby Hotel Del Monte in Del Monte, California, hosted a grand ball for the officers of the fleet. In Australia, the arrival of the Great White Fleet on August 20, 1908 was used to encourage support for the forming of Australia's own navy. In Sicily, the sailors helped in recovery operations after the 1908 Messina earthquake. President Theodore Roosevelt gunned turret at Wright, addresses officers and crewmen on Connecticut, in Hampton Roads, Virginia, upon her return from the fleet's cruise around the world, February 22, 1909. The 14-month-long voyage was intended to be a grand pageant of American naval power. The squadrons were manned by 14,000 sailors. They covered some 43,000 nautical miles and made 20 port calls on six continents. The fleet was impressive, especially as a demonstration of American industrial prowess, all 18 ships had been constructed since. The Spanish-American War, but already the battleships represented the suddenly outdated pre-dreadnought type of capital ship. As the first battleships of the revolutionary dreadnought class had just entered service, and the U.S. Navy's first dreadnought, South Carolina, was already fitting out. The two oldest ships in the fleet, Kearsarge and Kentucky, were already obsolete and unfit for battle, two others, Maine and Alabama, had to be detached at San Francisco because of mechanical troubles and were replaced by the Nebraska and the Wisconsin. After repairs, Alabama and Maine completed their own, more direct, circumnavigation of the globe via Honolulu, Guam, Manila, Singapore, Colombo, Suez, Naples, Gibraltar, the Azores, and finally back to the United States, arriving on October 20, 1908, four months before the remainder of the fleet, which had taken a more circuitous route. The battleships were accompanied during the first leg of their voyage by a torpedo flotilla of six early destroyers, as well as by several auxiliary ships. The destroyers and their tender did not actually steam in company with the battleships, but followed their own itinerary from Hampton Roads, Virginia to San Francisco, California. Also of note is that the armored cruiser Washington preceded the fleet itinerary for its first and second legs by about a month, perhaps making arrangements to later receive the fleet. Connecticut leads the way for the Great White Fleet in 1907. The Great White Fleet arriving to a crowd at the port of Los Angeles, 1908 Fleet Week celebrations in Auckland, New Zealand. With Connecticut as flagship under the command of Rear Admiral Robley D. Evans, the fleet sailed from Hampton Roads on December 16, 1907 for Trinidad, British West Indies. Thence to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Punta Arenas, Chile, Callao, Peru, Magdalena Bay, Mexico, and up the west coast, arriving at San Francisco, May 6, 1908. At San Francisco, Rear Admiral Charles S. Sperry assumed command of the fleet, owing to the poor health of Admiral Evans. Also at San Francisco, the squadrons were slightly rearranged, bringing the newest and best ships in the fleet up to the first squadron. Glacier was detached and later became the supply ship of the Pacific Fleet. At this time also, Nebraska, under Captain Reginald F. Nicholson, and Wisconsin, under Captain Frank E. Beatty, were substituted for Maine and Alabama. In San Francisco, Minnesota was brought forward into 1st Squadron, 1st Division and Louisiana took her place as flagship, 2nd Squadron. Leaving that port on July 7, 1908 the U.S. Atlantic Fleet visited Honolulu, Auckland, New Zealand, Sydney, Melbourne, and Albany, Australia, Manila, Philippines, Yokohama, Japan, and Colombo, Ceylon, then arriving at Suez, Egypt, on January 3, 1909. While the fleet was in Egypt, word was received of an earthquake in Sicily, thus affording an opportunity for the United States to show its friendship to Italy by offering aid to its victims. Connecticut, Illinois, Calgoa, and Yankton were dispatched to Messina, Italy, at once. 
The crew of Illinois recovered the bodies of the American consul, Arthur S. Cheney, and his wife, entombed in the ruins. Scorpion, the fleet station ship at Constantinople, and Celtic, a refrigerator ship fitted out in New York, were hurried to Messina, relieving Connecticut and Illinois so that they could continue on the cruise. Leaving Messina on January 9, 1909, the fleet stopped at Naples, Italy, thence to Gibraltar, arriving at Hampton Roads on February 22, 1909. There, President Roosevelt reviewed the fleet as it passed into the roadstead. From Hampton Roads to San Francisco, 14,556 nautical miles. The fleet, 1st Squadron, and 1st Division, were commanded by Rear Admiral Robley D. Evans. 1st Division consisted of four ships of the 1906 Connecticut class, Connecticut, the fleet's flagship, Captain Hugo Osterhaus, Kansas, Captain Charles E. Vreeland, Vermont, Captain William P. Potter, and Louisiana, Captain Richard Wainwright. 2nd Division was commanded by Rear Admiral William H. Emery. 2nd Division consisted of four ships of the 1904 Virginia class, Georgia, the division flagship, Captain Henry McCree, New Jersey, Captain William H. H. Sutherland, Rhode Island, Captain Joseph B. Murdoch, and Virginia, Captain Seton Schroeder. 2nd Squadron and 3rd Division were commanded by Rear Admiral Charles M. Thomas. 3rd Division consisted of one Connecticut-class ship and the three ships of the 1902 main class, Minnesota, the squadron flagship. Captain John Hubbard, Maine, Captain Giles B. Harbor, Missouri, Captain Greenleaf A. Merriam, and Ohio, Captain Charles W. Bartlett. Fourth Division was commanded by Rear Admiral Charles S. Berry. Fourth Division consisted of two ships of the 1901 Illinois class and the two 1900 Kearsarge class ships, Alabama, the division flagship, Captain Tanike DeWitt Veter, Illinois. Captain John M. Boyer, Kearsarge, Captain Hamilton Hutchins, and Kentucky, Captain Walter C. Cowles. The fleet auxiliaries consisted of Calgoa, Lt. Commander John B. Patton, Glacier, Commander William S. Hogg, Panther. Commander Valentine S. Nelson, Yankton, Lt. Walter R. Garrardi, and Relief. The torpedo flotilla of destroyers consisted of Hopkins, Lt. Alfred G. Howe, Stewart, Lt. Julius F. Helweg, Hull, Lt. Frank McCommon, Truxton. Lt. Charles S. Carrick, Lawrence, Lt. Ernest Friedrich, Whipple Lt. Hutch Icone, and Arethusa, Commander Albert W. Grant. Historical marker in Seattle that notes the 1908 arrival of the fleet. The fleet in San Francisco, Virginia is closest to the camera, with the other ships anchored nearby. Great White Fleet passing Trinidad Head, California 1908 The second leg of the voyage was from San Francisco to Puget Sound and back. On May 23, 1908 the 16 battleships of the Great White Fleet steamed into the Puget Sound where they separated to visit six Washington state ports, Bellingham, Bremerton, Port Angeles, Port Townsend, Seattle, and Tacoma. The fleet arrived in Seattle on 23 May and departed May 27, 1908. The fleet, 1st Squadron, and 1st Division were commanded by Rear Admiral Charles S. Berry. 1st Division consisted of Connecticut, the fleet's flagship, Captain Hugo Osterhaus, Kansas, Captain Charles E. Vreeland, Minnesota, Captain John Hubbard, and Vermont, Captain William P. Potter. Second Division was commanded by Rear Admiral Richard Wainwright. Second Division consisted of Georgia, the division flagship, Captain Edward F. Qualtro, Nebraska, Captain Reginald F. Nicholson, replacing her sister Virginia, New Jersey, Captain William H. H. Sutherland, and Rhode Island, Captain Joseph B. Murdoch. 2nd Squadron and 3rd Division were commanded by Rear Admiral William H. Emery. 3rd Division consisted of Louisiana, the squadron's flagship, Captain Kossuth Niles, Virginia, Captain Alexander Sharp, Missouri, Captain Robert M. Doyle, and Ohio, Captain Thomas B. Howard. 4th Division was commanded by Rear Admiral Seton Schroeder. 4th Division consisted of Wisconsin, the division flagship, Captain Frank E. Beatty, which replaced her sister Alabama, Illinois, Captain John M. Boyer, Kearsarge, Captain Hamilton Hutchins, and Kentucky, Captain Walter C. Cowles. The fleet auxiliaries were Calgoa, Lt. Commander John B. Patton, Yankton, Lt. Commander Charles B. McVeigh, Glacier. Commander William S. Hogg, Relief, Surgeon Charles F. Stokes, and Panther, Commander Valentine S. Nelson. From San Francisco to Manila, 16,336 nautical miles. 1908 Bronze Medallion for the Great White Fleet's visit to Auckland, New Zealand The fleet, 
1st Squadron, and 1st Division were commanded by Rear Admiral Charles S. Berry. 1st Division consisted of Connecticut, the fleet's flagship, Captain Hugo Osterhaus, Kansas, Captain Charles E. Vreeland, Minnesota, Captain John Hubbard, and Vermont, Captain William P. Potter. 2nd Division consisted of Georgia, the division flagship, Captain Edward F. Qualtro, Nebraska, Captain Reginald F. Nicholson, New Jersey, Captain William H. H. Sutherland, and Rhode Island, Captain Joseph B. Murdoch. The 2nd Squadron and 3rd Division were commanded by Rear Admiral William H. Emery. 3rd Division consisted of Louisiana, the squadron flagship, Captain Cosseth Niles, Virginia, Captain Alexander Sharp, Missouri, Captain Robert M. Doyle, and Ohio, Captain Thomas B. Howard. 4th Division was commanded by Rear Admiral Seton Schroeder. 4th Division consisted of Wisconsin, the division flagship, Captain Frank E. Beatty, Illinois, Captain John M. Boyer, Kearsarge, Captain Hamilton Hutchins, and Kentucky, Captain Walter C. Cowles. The fleet auxiliaries were Calgoa, Lt. Commander John B. Patton, Yankton, Lt. Commander Charles B. McVeigh, Glacier. Commander William S. Hogg, Relief, Surgeon Charles F. Stokes, and Panther, Commander Valentine S. Nelson. The final leg ran from Manila to Hampton Roads, 12,455 nautical miles. Political cartoon from the New York Herald, February 22, 1909. Uncle Sam, George Washington and Anne Theodore Roosevelt welcomed the Great White Fleet home to Hampton Roads, Virginia. The crews of the Great White Fleet provided practical experience for U.S. naval personnel in sea duty and ship handling. It also showed the viability of U.S. warships for long-range operations as no major mechanical mishaps occurred. However, while the crews uncovered design flaws, it did not test the abilities to engage in battle fleet action. In fact, the success of the deployment might have helped obscure design deficiencies that were not addressed until World War I. These included excessive draft, low armor belts, large turret openings and exposed ammunition hoists. According to Mark Albertson, Theodore Roosevelt's battleships captured the imagination of the world. The crews proved an immense public relations success for the Navy. Relations were fostered with nations that hitherto had been little more than names on a map, while relations with the familiar capitals were enhanced. The crews highlighted such deficiencies in American battleship design as the placement of armor and ammunition hoists. The lack of American logistical support was also laid bare, ramming home the lesson that without an adequate homegrown merchant marine, control of the seas was all but impossible. It demonstrated America's ability to transfer power from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. Valuable lessons learned in the projection of sea power would later pay handsome dividends in two global conflicts. But of greater importance is that Roosevelt's gambit elevated the United States to the ranks of a global powers. The Times of London editorialized regarding the extremely enthusiastic reception in Australia, a spectacular display has valuable uses in impressing the masses, who will remember the site for years. And draw important political deductions therefrom. The South Carolina-class battleship was laid down in 1906 and entered service in 1910 as the first American dreadnought. It was coal-fired. While the capital ships of the Great White Fleet were already obsolescent in light of the big gun revolution ushered in by the construction of HMS Dreadnought, their behavior at sea furnished valuable information that affected future construction. For instance, in terms of seaworthiness, all the capital ships in the fleet proved wet in all but the calmest seas, which led to the flared bows of subsequent U.S. battleships. Increased freeboard forward and such spray-reducing measures as the elimination of billboards for anchors and gun sponsons. Increased freeboard was needed, this and related considerations demanded increases in beam and overall size. Between the Florida-class battleships, the last American capital ships completed before data from the crews became available, and the Wyoming-class. The first designed after this data was received, displacement per ship increased by one-third. January 12, 1908, arrival at Rio de Janeiro, fleet enters Guanabara Bay deficiencies and seaworthiness in turn reduced the battle worthiness of the fleet. Turret heights for main armament proved too low and needed to be raised. Secondary armament was useless at speed and especially in trade wind conditions or greater, and needed to be moved much higher in the hull. Improved placement began with the Wyoming-class battleships and was further refined in the Nevada-class. Casemates for the bow three-inch guns and the newer pre-dreadnoughts were untenable due to wetness and were removed. Another discovery was that, even when fully loaded, the bottom of the battleship's side armor was visible, and the ships thus vulnerable to shells that might hit beneath it to reach their machinery and magazines, in smooth to moderate seas. 
The profile of crests and troughs in some ships contributed to this problem. Admiral Evans concluded that the standard 8-foot width of belt armor was inadequate. One other necessity the crews outlined was the need for tactical homogeneity. Before the crews, critics such as then-Captain William Sims had argued that American warship design had remained too conservative and precluded the level of efficiency needed for the fleet to function as an effective unit. The crews proved the charge true. This would eventually lead to the building of standard-type battleships in the U.S. Navy. When President Roosevelt convened the 1908 Newport Conference of the Naval War College, he placed responsibility for U.S. battleship design on the General Board of the United States Navy. This gave line officers and planners direct input and control over warship design, a pattern which has persisted to the present day. Experience gained by the crews led to improvements in formation steaming, coal economy and morale. Gunnery exercises doubled the fleet's accuracy. However, the mission also underlined the fleet's dependence on foreign colliers and the need for coaling stations and auxiliary ships for resupply. Notes Citations Book Jacket of Matthews, with the Battle Fleet. Thanks for watching.